So I'm very pleased to introduce our seminar speaker today, Dr. Ben Rottenberg from Cal Poly, one of my academic brothers for years and years. We've known each other for 15 years now. We're lab mates together in grad school, shared an office together, shared many adventures and misadventures uh, over that time together, both in research and otherwise. Um, a little bit about Ben. Uh, uh, he did his undergraduate degree at Tufts University, where he studied political science or English. One of the political science. He had a very different path. You see, then worked for about a year at a publishing company, I believe, and decided this is not what I want to be doing. I like biology. So then he decided, well, I'm going to get a graduate degree. He went to the Yale School of Forestry, so he got his master's, where he did his research in the Galapagos, studying artisanal fisheries. So that's a bit of a circuitous story. Uh, he then came to UC Santa Barbara, where we had the same PhD advisor, Bob Warner. And we spent a lot of time together in St. Croix doing research in Hawaii. He actually did his PhD research, though, back in the Galapagos, where he was using photochemistry techniques to study moral dispersal of the damn fish, as well as to try to and fail and try again. We've been at multiple times in our career. And uh, say like this period. After he finished his PhD, he did a postdoc for maybe a year and a half or so in Ensenada, and then he did a short postdoc with Lisa Levin at Scripps for about three months, and then got a position uh, with the National Park Service in Florida, running a big, large-scale coral reef monitoring program. He was there for a couple of years, and then moved to a position at the National Marine Fisheries Service in Miami, where he ran an even larger coral reef monitoring program, part of which we'll talk about today. From the moment he got to Florida, he was scheming on how to get back to California. <laughs> It took him about six years, but uh, he recently got a position at, at Cal Poly and, and just started this uh, this past fall. And so now he's learning what it's like to be uh, faculty in the CSU system. And he's teaching a lot and is overworked and enjoying it all. <laughs> right. So the title of the talk today, Fear, Loathing, and Monitoring in the Caribbean, the Challenges of Maintaining Options. <coughs> Perturbable system than the Indo Pacific. This is just sort of some. 
some background about the Caribbean, since I'm sure some of you have probably spent some time there, but I'm guessing many of you have spent most of your time um, in uh, California. In California. Um, relative to the Indo-Pacific, though, um, the Caribbean has much, much lower diversity, so there's much less functional redundancy in the Caribbean, which makes it Metric of 
human population density and relating that to the size of, of predatory fish that they found. And again, not particularly surprising, where you have fewer people, you have predators that don't work, um, where you have fewer people, you have larger uh, uh, sharks and groupers, where you have lots of people, your dominant predators are trophic fish. So some pretty significant changes um, Caribbean wide. Right? Um, so against this background, um, I was working when I moved over to NOAA on um, the Florida Keys Reef Visual Census Monitoring Program. And sort of the irony about this program is that it's actually a random stratified survey design, very sophisticated. It is actually not a census. We weren't counting every single fish out there. And somehow this name got named 30 years ago and stuff. Um, but like with any monitoring program, the point of this um, is to uh, examine the status of trends of these fish populations, uh, provides us with a fisheries independent data set that we can use for stock assessments, and they have been used in, in, uh, in some of the stock assessments for the, the snapper and groupers in, uh, in, in Florida and the South Atlantic. Um, and then we can also use these data to about evaluate management actions, such as MPAs that were implemented in the Keys. Um, and because this <coughs> program has been going on for so long over this fairly significant scale of the entire Florida Keys, we can look at large temporal and spatial changes and the beauty of this is that the methodology has been um, essentially unchanged over the last 30 to 35 years. Um, so it gives you some of a, a, a brief introduction to the method. It's the, it's the stationary point count, the average time the water, and this was, I don't know, when this was probably made 30 years ago, right? Um, and somehow it's been propagating through all the people that give a talk on these data at the same slide. Um, you got your diver sitting on the bottom, and he's happily, he or she is happily counting fish inside uh, the cylinder of 15 meters uh, diameter. And just to provide you with some evidence that we have actually been doing this for a long time, here's a couple of photos of divers counting fish. And you can tell that they're old because how many of you have seen a first color BC? Um, probably not very many. There's actually some live cropper up in this photo, which you can't see much of anymore. And while NOAA has always been about safety and diving, they require divers to wear snorkels, they haven't always required them. <laughs> 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 right. So, uh, so here is the Florida Keys. We got Miami in the upper right hand, upper right hand corner, um, Key West uh, down the lower uh, left, and we've got the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and then to about 70 miles west of Key West is the Dry Tortugas. Um, out here, the Dry Tortugas. Uh, you can imagine that the, the, the pressure for, from human impacts in the Keys is significant. There's about a million registered boats in in South Florida. Um, it's much harder to get out to the dry tortugas because, well, it's 70 miles out there. It takes a lot of money to cast. Um, and uh, so I'm just focusing on this area just to the uh, uh, east of Key West over here. Um, and, uh, uh, kind of and I'll highlight for just to uh, give you an example of how this monitoring program works. So we've taken the entire Florida reef track. It goes from basically the top of it, um, uh, about 150 miles north of Miami, down to the dry tortugas out here got this entire area mapped out. We're going to zoom in on one spot here. So here's a, uh, a satellite image of, uh, of the area around Key West. Um, we've got a couple of no-take reserves. And what you'll notice that this reserve on the left side here is the only reserve in the Keys that extends from the shoreline out to the edge of the reef track. Um, all the rest of them are more like this little postage stamp thing that covers just some top of a reef. They're really, really small. Um, this is the only one that well, what we did with this monitoring program, we actually overlaid a grid um, over the entire area. And then with each one of these grid cells, we were able to assign it to a specific habitat type. Um, we've got several habitat types. Uh, spur and groove reef down here. We've got catch reef um, here. And within each of these habitat types, by having the entire reef track mapped out, we have a really good sense of how much of each habitat type there is. We can then stratify our sampling within each of these habitat types giving us uh, an estimate without having to actually census every single one of these cells. We actually get an estimate of what the both abundance and variance structure is in each of these habitat types throughout this, allowing us ultimately to roll these metrics up and come up with estimates for total abundance um, uh, of a given species across, the, across both within habitat types. We've got depth categories in these, in these, in these grid cells. Um, we've got regions, whether it's upper, middle, or lower keys. Um, and so in each one of these, these categories, which are what we call individual strata, we're able to allocate our sampling based on 
the variant um, in each of these strata. So a stratum that is a very particular, you know, might be low abundance, like some uh, uh, high relief sperm group reef, it's, it's not a very common habitat, but it tends to have a very high abundance and a high variance of many of the species we're interested in. And so we're going to allocate disproportionately more sampling to that in order to bring down that variance. It allows us to come up with a better estimate across the entire system, both within each of these habitat types and when we roll this up across the entire point of key. So we can actually come up with estimates of how many of species X are there, or species X at size class Y across the entire system. So it's a really, really powerful, uh, really, really powerful. Um, okay, so uh, the rough timeline of things that had happened in the Keys um, from the 1950s and 1970s, and obviously continuing on today, um, there's fairly heavy fishing pressure. Um, the uh, Reef Fish Monitoring Program began in 1980. Um, 1983-84, we had the sea urchin die-off and rapid loss of live coral um, throughout the entire Caribbean basin. Um, these postage stamp reserves were implemented in 1997 in the main Florida Keys, and then in 2001 and 2007, we had a couple of additional no take reserves to Dry Star Puget Bank and Dry Star Puget National Park on the, on the Star Puget Reef. All right, so the first analysis that I'm going to show you, um, the initial sampling was actually not using this wonderful, sophisticated survey design. It was really focused on a couple of specific reefs. Most of these were the high, high-relief sperm group areas, and so to make sure that we are comparing apples to apples, for the full time series, I'm going to restrict this analysis just to these habitat areas because these were the things that were sampled initially. And we know that both the abundance and the variance structure in these in this high-relief sperm group reefs are not necessarily representative of, say, the low-relief pavement areas that are the much more abundant habitat that we keep. Um, keep in mind that there, the no-take reserves were added in 97, and we're gonna look at, for this analysis, three uh, response variables. First, abundance when present, that is, how many did we see when we saw them? Um, the frequency of occurrence, how often we saw them when we, when we surveyed them, and then density, which is then this rolled up metric that includes all the zeros and all the other as well. So looking at something like a black grouper, which is one of um, the largest groupers in the Keys, and certainly one of the most prized uh, fishery species, both for recreational and commercial fisheries, um, the abundance when present, the blue are the reserves, the red are the non-reserve areas. Um, see, not much of a change in the abundance when present, but the frequency of occurrence after, uh, um, oh, excuse me, uh, after here we've got the, the urchin and coral mortality in the mid-1980s, and then the reserves are implemented here in 97. And so when we look at frequency of occurrence, that jumped significantly after 97, only inside the areas that that became reserves, and so that, oops, so the overall density that we see here is driven primarily by that increase in occurrence, not necessarily an increase in abundance when we actually saw. Usually when we saw them, we saw one, maybe two individuals, that's about it. Um, uh, in contrast, this uh, species, three-spot damselfish, tends to be strongly associated with live coral. Um, they're also vicious, if you ever try to go um, steal eggs from one of these guys, they are um, ferocious, they will attack you. Um, I have a friend who's, who's done some work, a lot of work on and says, pound for pound, these are the most ferocious fish. <laughs> I can't imagine if there was a shark the size of the most terrifying thing ever. Um, but as the, uh, as the, the urchin and coral mortality events uh, transpired in, in the Caribbean and the Keys, we see this essentially huge decline in the abundance of, uh, of, these, of these particular fish. A couple of things to note down here that that density basically flatlined essentially after 1990, and that abundance of these and the other thing to note that you know most monitoring programs, if we had 20 years of data, we would think that we had a really good handle on the dynamics of the system. If we only had 20 years of data in the system, we would have missed the entire story. And I have no doubt that if we were able to push this back to 1970 or 1960, that the story for everything I'm going to tell you would be probably pretty good. So keep that kind of in the back of your mind that this started just before one of the major events, but there were certainly lots of other background things happening throughout the Caribbean for the last several decades before this. Um, so this is really only part of, uh, of the story. Um, and so you can look at, you can look at, these, at these sort of mind-numbing uh, time series plots um, uh, and you know, try to extract some information from them. But you know, we, we thought maybe there's a different way of looking at this. Rather than just looking at an overall density, we, we thought maybe we'd look at this both um, treating 
the abundance when present and the frequency of occurrence as independent, uh, essentially independent variables. And so if something like the Black River, say, is in low abundance um, and low occurrence, it's going to be down here in that lower left corner of the plot. Um, uh, if, say, you implement the marine reserve, that population might move to that upper corner where you increase in occurrence and increase in abundance. But you may have a situation where you have something that's sort of at, at moderate levels of occurrence and moderate levels of abundance. And something may happen that the abundance decreases, but the occurrence increases. Or the occurrence decreases and the abundance increases. And if you're just looking at density, that line, anything that's moving along that line is going to show up essentially as a flat line in the density. You're not going to pick that up in your density measures. You're going to see this showing up much more when you're looking at the independent, uh, independent responses. Something like, say, the loss of a significant portion of habitat might lead to increased patchiness of, of a species as they're moving towards those few patches that have habitat left. Um, so it's kind of another way of looking at these data. And just kind of look at this um, uh, well, as an animation, as kind of like a time series, this would be Black River from the um, areas that were to become the marine reserves. And we see that for the first, you know, 15 or 20 years, 15 or so years of this of this uh, time series, there really wasn't much of a change. Low abundance and low occurrence. Now remember, the reserves were implemented in 1997, and we're hoping, or at least a species like this, that it's going to move into that uh, upper right-hand corner of the plot. And sure enough, after implementation of reserves, what we see is an increase, in this case, in both occurrence and a small increase in abundance, not very much. And so this change is really driven primarily by changes in the frequency of occurrence. Um, and we can do this for as many different species as we want. Um, these are four of the, uh, the main target species in the Keys, black river, mountain snapper, yellowtail snapper, and hogfish. And they also the same basic pattern in the areas that became the reserve. Not really that surprising um, that if you, if you stop there, if you, if you close the area to fishing, exactly what we see, it's kind of what we were hoping to see in the, in the reserves in the Keys. Um, the non-reserve areas didn't show much of a, much of a change at all, uh, with the possible exception of mutton snapper, which didn't seem to increase its abundance much, much, but we did start to see it a little more frequently, and I'll talk a little bit more about why we think that, um, that pattern is true, particularly for hogfish. Um, but again, all four, of these, all four of these species seem to show this, this increase in occurrence and in abundance. Now looking at for non-target species, these are species that tend to be much more associated with, uh, with live coral. Um, uh, bluegrass, tomtate, yellowtail damselfish, and our ferocious least spot damselfish. All of them mm -hmm. show the same basic patterns that there's either a de decrease in occurrence or abundance. Now, bluegrass is one of the most ubiquitous fish in the Caribbean, as Scott knows. Or kind of Kinsley Curley. And so its occurrence is nearly universal, but what we do see is that basically almost a Okay, so coming back 
to our ability to then roll these metrics up. Now, this was using the entire time series. I said we restricted it just to the high release burn groups. Now, if we want to look kind of more broadly, um, we began sampling in the dry tortugas starting in 1999. And, and around that time, a few years earlier, earlier we had begun sampling about 95 or 96. We began sampling throughout the Florida Keys. So by about 99, we have the ability to then roll all of these numbers up and come up with estimates for total abundance in the Keys and in, um, in the dry tortugas. And so what's significant about the dry tortugas, again, that they are um, 70 miles west of Key West. There's much less fishing pressure out there. It's expensive to get out there. We actually saw um, from some of the recreational survey data, a significant drop in visitation on the dry tortugas um, starting in about 2008 to 2010, driven primarily by the economy. So the economy tanked and people didn't have money to go throw away on a, on a recreational fishing trip. Visitation actually this place decreased significantly, which probably also significantly decreased recreational fishing pressure. Um, and so there are three areas out in the dry tortugas that I want to consider. We've got the Tortugas Bank no take rain, rain Reserve. We've got the Tortugas Bank area that's open to fishing. And we've got the Dry Tortugas National Park. And then we've got the Keys no take rain Reserve here. And then the light blue is just the area that is open to fishing in the Keys. And again, if it, uh, oh, um, and then well, why the Dry Tortugas are significant, we've got this loop current coming up through the Gulf of Mexico. Again, you may have heard of the loop current. We're familiar with it beforehand. Probably heard of it after the water horizon. This is a screaming current, essentially the very beginning of the Gulf Stream, um, that rips from the dry tortugas out to uh, down, downstream to the Florida Keys. There's quite a lot of uh, research showing that this current forms eddies, large and large train in these eddies, and you get, you get pulses of recruitment generally coincident with these, um, with these eddy formations. So it can be a significant source of larvae, larval transport to the rest of the Florida Keys. And again, if the video is working, I'm showing this fantastic video of a Mutton, mutton snapper spawning aggregation with a screaming current. It's actually a really cool video to show that on the because there's a huge bunch of these really big muttons that you don't see very often. The camera is getting smacked by um, algae that's flying by because the current is ripping through here, and then a lot of head are opened by and blunders into the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine all that happening. Um, Scott and I will ask after you And so I actually had not seen one of these aggregations on the dry tortugas. I was on a, on a couple of trips when we were looking for spawning aggregations in the Keys. And a spawning aggregation once now from the Keys consists of three individuals. If you must ever saw it one. Um, and there's lots of them. Um, OK, so um, again, now we're able to take these rolled up metrics and estimate the total abundance. In this case, we're now looking at, at spawning age or spawning size adult individuals um, across each of these different areas. And the percentages below them represent the total area that each of these, each of these areas occupy. So if within this entire domain, including the dry tortugas and the Florida Keys, um, the fish area of the Keys, that is the area that's open in the Keys, is almost 60% of the total habitat. Um, the reserves occupy only 3.6% of that total habitat. So really small in the reserve. Dry tortugas National Park that is but what we see is, um, in this case, looking at the data from 99 to 2000, again, remember that some of these reserves <coughs> in the Tortugas were implemented in, uh, in 2001, um, out of the, the Tortugas region in 2007, we see a significant, huge increase in the total abundance of mutton snapper across the board, across this entire system, um, from 99 to 2000 to our last sampling in 2000. Um, anywhere from a 100% increase to a 60% <coughs> increase in the abundance um, across this, uh, across this uh, the system. Um, um, Red Grouper, which I didn't even show you any data from the Keys because their abundances are so, so low that they barely show up there. Um, when we sample Red Grouper, the abundance uh, in the Tortugas National Park, 53% of the total individuals in this system are found in, that, in just the National Park. And in the two protected areas in the Tortugas region, we've got um, over three quarters of the total population in, um, in around 30% of the, of the total area. So a uh, much, much greater proportion of this area, again, in the upstream area of the tri-Tortugas, that's likely going to be seeding, um, 
cheating the rest of the system. One of the reasons that that, um, that red grouper get fished out so much is that they're sort of like dogs. When you're underwater, they will come up to you and sort of go, hey, what are you doing? Is that good? That's good. Cool. Is that good? Cool. Is that spear? What are you doing?
took the satellite image and they did a bunch of photo interpretation. It turns out that um, like in the Keys, a lot of this is not particularly good habitat. A huge percentage of this area was sand, which actually made it easier. It made it that there's a lot less stuff for us to sample. So we took these maps um, and you know, went down there <laughs> and started, you know, I come up with this great sampling design. We did the same thing with grid and habitats, even though we didn't know anything about abundance. We're able to still um, allocate our samples based on the abundance of these different habitats. We got down there, you know, sampling all over this, all over this map, and our deepest sites were about three meters away. We couldn't figure out what's going on. Why are deepest sites but 25 feet? We should be in much deeper water than this. Well, it turns out that the photo interpreter when we went down to 10 meters. The guy who made these maps thought that they were down to 30 meters as they were as they were creating these maps. He said, oh yeah, yeah, we should have coverage down to 30 meters. We get out there. So there was a huge amount of area that was available, appropriate habitat, that where these guys were fishing, where there were resources that we had no idea what was out there. So on day, I think it was day two or day three, I think it was day two of the cruise, I think this is when we realized what was going on. We figured out, we figured out, we figured out, finally figured out what was going on, and it was up until like four o'clock in the morning. I spent how much time making this beautiful sampling plan, had to reconfigure the entire thing on the fly. Um, there were some additional challenges. Uh, the good days when we were there, um, they had the, the worst two weeks of weather they had in months. Um, the good days were blowing 15 to 20 knots. And keep in mind that the east side of this island is an open Atlantic Ocean. And so any bump of swell or wind or anything is going to make significant ugly conditions on the east side. Um, which made, and that's actually where most of the reef is too. So they were really hard for us to get out there. The bad days were 30 knots. So it was, it was normal. And so this is what the map looked like after. Um, we realized that all this, this stuff, this brown stuff, is this hard bottom habitat, that huge amount of area that we didn't have maps for. So we kind of had to reconfigure this on the fly. We still managed to get a decent amount done um, while we were there in two weeks. Um, pretty significant amount of sampling effort with the team that we had, including uh, over 100 fish sites and 100 coral sites. Um, this is some of the data I'm going to talk about today. You go into an island, it's the remote part of the Caribbean, it's the northeast corner, you know, there's only 1,500 people. It's a low island, so there's no runoffs. So a lot of these other pressures and threats that we think about in the Caribbean should not be going on. And we jumped in the water, and this is what we saw. Um, we call this standing turf. Um, and then we went to a different site, and this is what we saw. We went to a different site, and we got to this. It's a little variety. Sand, there's the sand turf. And then we went to a different site, and look, there was dead standing in front of us. Um, not a lot of live coral on this island. Um, we had Two, I think it was three sites that were greater than 10% black coral. Um, the vast majority of it was between zero and 10. Not a whole lot of black coral around this island. But some of this, there was some recent standing dead, so clearly we had been some black coral recently, and we don't know what it was that killed it. It certainly wasn't the die off of the die demon in 1980, because that stuff had been around for a lot longer. Um, you see that these areas are completely dominated by turf, and really not even a lot of natural islands relative to maybe the parts of the Caribbean that we see. So there's no sites with puts us even for the Caribbean at the low end of the coral. Um, and we thought, well, what's going on? You know, maybe it's a maybe it's a grazing thing, you know. Um, so we looked at uh, parrotfish, uh, total parrotfish biomass um, in pretty low levels. And again, to put this in context, the parrotfish are important grazers of algae and the Caribbean reefs, but they really don't like grazing this sand turf matrix. They don't like being this stuff. Probably working a whole lot of it. Maybe not, not a lot of macro algae, but there wasn't a lot of food for them. And so when we again put this into context, this is the bottom plot is from um, uh, the unpublished report that, that Jeremy Jackson group is putting together. Again, even for the Caribbean, uh, these data, um, the bottom plot are from, are from uh, all of this, all of the data that they've synthesized for the Caribbean in the current time. These are low relative to the Indo Pacific. Again, relative to the rest of the Caribbean, even for dudes. Not a lot of good news in terms of the fish communities. Um, not a lot of good news in terms of the coral communities. Uh, there are a couple of three big species of parrotfish. We saw um, two individuals of one of those species and zero of the others in you know, 100 recovery sites we hit. Um, and we saw a couple of them that were not very much. So um, pretty heavily impacted fish communities. Um, but ironically, they're actually not targeting fish. Their main thing that they're, oh, uh, and then just a kind of means uh, Four grams per meter square of parrotfish biomass in Barbuda, about 12 in the, in the rest of the Caribbean. Florida, ironically, is, is only about five. Um, and there's no parrotfish fishing in Florida. So again, something strange is happening between Florida and Barbuda. They're not. 
not related. Certainly the processes that are occurring here are, are very, very different, even though they seem to be showing the same kind of thing. Um, but in, in a lot of the Eastern Caribbean, a lot of the Caribbean, the, the main, uh, the main uh, fishery species are lobster. Um, this is actually one of the guys we were working with who's um, a pretty good lobster fisherman himself. He was actually catching these for us so we could measure them. And what we saw um, was some pretty significant large lobsters. Abundance was low, but the habitat was really patchy. Lobsters are often hard to catch with uh, the scuba surveys anyway. Um, but the size frequency that we found, um, I mean, some of these, these are, this is uh, size class of carapace length. Um, the largest individuals that we see in Florida, um, even in the protected areas, are only between you know, 120 and 130 millimeters of carapace length. The largest ones in the protected areas of Florida, and here along the side, we had some that were um, up to 180 um, millimeters of carapace length. Carapace length is a pretty small sample size. The other thing is, we found some data from, where is this now, 40 years ago. And this is size frequency data that, that this, this study collected data. They were free diving, not on scuba, but the size frequency is nearly identical. Suggesting that, well, you know, maybe this lobster population is actually still in, in pretty good shape, despite the fact that this is their main, um, this is their main reef. So, even though the reefs are not in great shape, the fish communities are not in great shape, we do have some indication that lobster are actually doing pretty well. Um, our uh, abundance estimates for lobster is really hard to get to get these data, so I don't have a lot of confidence in our abundance estimates. We have nothing to compare them to. Um, but the size class should tell us something about what's and again, pretty good overlap, suggesting that you know, at least their main target species is still doing is still doing pretty well. And as a result of all this, um, so you see that the largest these largest size classes are actually present in Barbuda that weren't even there uh, 40 years ago. So we think that's we think that's really encouraging. Um, and again, here's the uh, the max size data from Florida as a comparison. Um, uh, the largest individuals that they found in these fish areas. Significantly larger in Barbuda, despite the fact this is their, this is their main uh, group. And so, as a result of this, um, the local uh, the local governing council, with input from the community, including uh, including the entire fishing community, actually has has drawn up a draft of, uh, of a whole bunch of, of now they're calling marine sanctuaries, or these are actually no take reserves. Um, a pretty healthy proportion of the reefs around this island are now going to be. And so um, we are we are hoping that certainly um, things like lobster and and conch, which I didn't show you today, there are conch abundances are kind of moderate relative to the rest of the Caribbean. But there's certainly some hope that they can. This is a community-driven process that they can actually um, be forcing. We think they can. I think there's a good chance that we might actually see some recovery, at least of the things that they're fishing. I don't think there's a whole lot of hope for again for coral in the system, um, but certainly some of the fish.
just monitoring plans to try to understand what's happening more over uh, large scales and long term out of the hands of individual parks where you've got turnover and change and putting it in localized offices that are designed to, uh, to run these things um, at, at a more regional level. So our office is based in Miami and we have two, two parks in South Florida and two parks in the Virgin Islands. Um, and there was a very long process that they went through um, before I got there um, to come up with what they call their vital signs monitoring plan this is a several hundred page document, and one of their core vital signs, the things that they really wanted to measure, were marine benthic communities. And in this context, marine benthic communities means coral. So we wanted to know what was going on with coral. So we started this, this coral monitoring program, and um, we're collecting information on, on uh, coral cover from a whole bunch of sites and a couple of, of these different parts. And so this is what some of the initial data, uh, I guess, some of the initial data from the first several years monitoring program from some of the sites in the Virgin Islands National Park, that's on St. John and Buck Island Reef, that's on St. Croix. Um, many of you may not have been aware that in uh, 2000, uh, 2005, 2006, there was a massive bleaching event um, followed by disease that hit a lot of the Caribbean. We had huge decreases in live coral throughout, um, throughout both of these national parks, right? losses of about 50% of information to managers so that when something happened, we have this monitoring data as a trigger to go take a management action. So the most important vital sign is coral. We're measuring coral, we're monitoring coral, we have a loss of 50% of live coral. That should be a management trigger, right? And so the managers in these parks
I want to try to understand what the different impacts of these parameters are and where they're hanging out. And so um, uh, Tom and Adam spent a lot of time last summer following these parameters around in, uh, in the Caribbean and basically collecting behavioral data on, on what they're eating. Um, a bunch of different habitat types. Um, uh, we ran a cluster analysis on them and found that they, they tend to cluster up more or less phylogenetically, which is not too surprising. Three of the species of Sparasoma tend to be eating primarily these brown macroalgae, whereas the species of Scarus, those are the ones with a much more fused beak, um, are eating primarily this, uh, this turf algae and CCA, with the exception on the far right of Sparisoma viridae, the stoplight parrotfish, that, that clusters out much more with the scarce species, primarily eating turf algae and CCA. And that matches um, a lot of preliminary work, uh, or earlier work that we've done on Sparisoma viridae that suggested that it tends to be eating much more like the scarce than the Sparisoma. So it's always nice when you go to a study and be able to confirm what you thought you already knew, um, which is actually really encouraging. Um, so the, the, the scar species plus parasoma are, are primarily eating uh, this turf and CCA, um, whereas these parasoma are primarily eating these brown, uh, these brown macroalgae. Right? So both could be potentially important depending on what the dominant species of algae is in a given place. Um, but then when, when we looked at where these individuals were found, what we found was that these um, uh, some of this, some of the scarce species, and some of the some species actually fell out in different areas. That that um, one of the, the scarce uh, ceruleus, the, the blue parrot fish, along with um, uh, a couple of the others, um, were spending most of their time hanging out in boulder and rubble areas, and maybe some lower lowland trees. These are not places where we're likely to find a whole lot of coral. And so the potential impact of these species on grazing where we are likely to get coral back, it's likely to be really, really low. Um, um, this, so the second group that's sort of in high and low relief kind of mix, um, including um, a couple of the other sparasomas and one of the scars. And then these two species here, um, scar spatula, that's the queen parrotfish, and sparasoma viridae, the stoplights, are those species that tend to be hanging out much more in that purple area. That's the high relief reef. This is the reef that's much more likely to have live coral. Um, so these two species may actually be the focus of uh, our efforts. If we're trying to try to restore some of these rivers fish communities, um, we may be much more likely to have success um, having increasing our grazing potential by looking at, at by, by trying to recover these specific species than this assemblage as And so we also then were able to look at, um, using the, the, our data from the entire Florida Keys, look at where these species tend to be found more commonly. And so looking at this density, this high relief reef, that's the high relief spur and group four reef, these two species, which are grazing, all of them are grazing, this turf algae, and tend to be found from um, observational data in the high relief areas. Again, it's really nice to have independent data sets that show you, that confirm the same thing, but it's really, really encouraging when we saw that these two species tend to be found much more much more commonly in this high relief in these high relief reefs. And so across the scale of the entire Florida Keys, these species are actually probably found more much more likely to be found in areas where we are trying to get coral back and much more likely to be grazing on the things that may be actually be eating the black coral. Um, as, a, as a contrast, um, this uh, red-tailed parrotfish, which is more of a macroalgal browser, its lowest abundance is in the area um, in the high relief reef and the inshore patch reef. These are the two habitats that have the highest coral cover in the keys. It's also low, but they tend to be really abundant in these um, low relief four reef areas that don't have a lot of coral, and some of the uh, the, the, the patch reefs also don't have a lot of black coral. So, focusing on recovery efforts on this species are much less likely to get us to the place that we want to get to um, with respect to. Um, all right, so future steps for this project is actually the, the next step is to get, get ourselves back in the water and actual, rather than quantify just what they're eating um, or, or where they're hanging out, actually quantify their, their specific grazing impact um, by species and by size. 
Um, and then we'll be able to take monitoring data from Florida, from Barbuda, from the Virgin Islands, from wherever else we've got these monitoring data and be able to scale up um, these metrics of grazing by species, by size, to come up with some overall uh, grazing impact of the assembly. And again, we can uh, provide managers with some much more specific information about the species that are much more likely to have a positive impact on, on, the, on the coral system that, that, that they're trying to preserve. Um, and, then, and then ultimately, what we want to be able to relate this uh, assemblage grazing impact back to other metrics of uh, benthic community, coral cover, coral intrusion, available space for, for coral, these, these sorts of things. These are several steps. And this is the first step we're hoping to get at some this summer. Um, the next two are, are likely to take a couple of years. But this is ultimately well, this is where we want to get to and be able to provide, ideally, a really simple way of translating basic monitoring data that exists throughout the Caribbean into some level of grazing impact and, and what that's actually going to mean well, with respect to the future of the All right, so just time to wrap this whole thing up. Um, I'm still a really strong proponent that monitoring data can be, can be very, very useful to help us understand patterns uh, uh, of change, patterns of habitat use, where key pieces, where key individuals or species are hanging out, and we can then ultimately help translate those things back to uh, back to managers. But it's really important to make sure that the data that we're collecting from the monitoring program match the needs of the management, and that there is some ability that the manager is trying to use these data to make a management action. That there's some appropriate management action that they can take based on monitoring data. It's really important to keep that in mind. And it's often lost. People just go out and start counting stuff, and after a couple of years, they just keep doing it the way they're doing it because that's how they've been doing it. There are some glimmers of hope throughout the Caribbean. Um, there's not a lot. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess our, we're just going to have to keep sliding through this and you know, try to better understand what, what some of the impacts are and what some of the potential ways to, to help off the recovery are going to be. Um, obviously, there's an enormous number of people that have been through all of this work. I can't possibly thank them all, um, especially the, you know, I'm literally
in that particular instance, the management, you know, what can you do in the face of catastrophic, you know, God-like consequences of a 50% um, mortality, but you know, if you hadn't been out there making those measurements, it would be anecdotal, right? You'd say, oh, everybody realizes all this coral bleaching happened, but you wouldn't really know the extent and have all this background data for the managers to be able to say, look, we couldn't have managed this system and we couldn't have managed our way around this cataclysmic event, and the data that you have are really stupendous because you put together this monitoring system. So I guess I want to be an advocate for the success of your program. Instead of, you know, I know you can't manage your way around that, but I think, I don't know, I just, I want to say that I think it's really, really good to have those, those monitoring programs in place, even if you don't always know what you're going to do with the data. And I, I, I guess I, I, made, I made that criticism a little too partially, that yeah. with all these monitoring programs, you have limited resources. Yes. Right. And in this particular case, I think that there were ways that we could have gotten very told a very similar story with much less um, temporally intensive. Yeah. That this the program that I work from the Park Service, they spent an enormous amount of resources just taking it out on call. And I think that given that there are limited resources, that we could have scaled back up. And I absolutely agree that being able to tell the story and go to somebody and say, hey, this is happening, even though something you can do, at least we want to know about it. Uh, I certainly don't want, to, don't want to say, we shouldn't be monitoring at all, but if you have the X amount of resources, maybe you don't put all of them into just this monitoring thing that doesn't have some trigger, but that you allocate some of those resources towards trying to maybe get some more, more mechanistic understanding of what's going on. I totally agree with you. We would have fun, because yeah. I think that's where we need to go, is to find some ultimate proxies to get those big things with much, much less resources. And so in, you know, in, in, in the Keys, as, as an example, in the Keys, you know, we have been doing annual monitoring for 30 years in the Keys. We have a pretty good handle on what's going on in the Keys. And we know that you know the year-on-year -year changes are not cute. And so we've actually, this is happening as I left NOAA, so we, I get to help design this thing and then push it off and let something else to implement it. But um, we scale back to going every other year in the Keys and beginning to allocate some of our resources towards going to places like St. Croix and the rest of the USVI and Puerto Rico to try to get some similar kinds of information. Again, not, we're not going to be able to cover all of this space as intensively as we did for this amount of time in the Keys. But with limited resources, I do think it's worth us trying to spread some of that effort around to be able to provide some of that information in some of these other places. I'll ask one, one quick question and then uh, I'm happy hour. So in terms of managing for sort of increasing the grazing pressure and increasing some of those important grazers, do you think the way forward is to try to design management actions for those particular character species that seem to be important to the system, or instead just to try to protect the habitats where they occur? You also pick them up as well, like protecting those nice coral habitats. What's more important than individuals? Party the parish or party the So I, I actually, again, I don't think that, you, I, I think that maybe that an either or is probably the wrong approach. Like it's, it's actually trying to protect, you know, if you can get some spatial protection of some of these key habitats, I think that's important. But also in you know, places like St. Croix, which is what spawned the ball, the start of this, small, this, this entire parish project was um, the parish fisheries in St. Croix, and there was huge resistance from the local community, the local fishing community, against putting any restrictions on parish. And so it may be we may be able to identify that, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's actually not all the species, that some of these species, like, you know, like the red tail, may actually be okay to take. And that the other things are much more important. So there may be ways to sort of tweak management to be able to, you know, fine tune it, because it's really our fine tune management in place like St. Croix, but um, you know, in an ideal world, be able to provide some information and then you know, you know, the managers will figure out how to implement this stuff. Like, right, like, here's what we want to do, and then I guess Maybe it's not someone else's job. It makes some suggestions about how best to have that.